Welcome everybody tonight. I can't believe that we have gone through so many weeks already and that spring is here. When we started this, the snow was blowing and everything was kind of nasty outside. And now it looks like the spring is coming and it's exciting. Um, for tonight's lecture, I'm going to ask that we start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And when everyone is ready, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. As always at the Silver Sides, we have some wonderful sponsors that care very much about education and military history. The primary sponsor of this series is the Lorraine F. Birch and the Fred H. Birch Foundation. They're a West Michigan couple who met during World War II and they felt that a life of serving their community is the most and utmost importance. In honor of that service, their family has founded the foundation which is promoting and funding this lecture series. They believe that promoting service at the community, state, and federal level through education is the ultimate thing that they can do. And we would like to thank the Birch Foundation for honoring us with their sponsorship. Our media sponsor for this evening is Blue Lake Public Radio. They do an exceptional job in very difficult times and they're always that wonderful break that we all need just to get a little outside of ourselves and listen to some wonderful classical music. And we thank them for being our media sponsor. As we talked about a little bit last week, we oftentimes during our lecture series don't talk about the history of the Silver Sides. The staff and I do that a lot at the museum and we tend to have our lectures be on topics of other military history. And if you come out to the museum, you'll definitely get the entire history of the Silver Sides. But this week on Wednesday from 7 to 8 p.m., I will be presenting for the State of Michigan's Historical Society at their History Hounds lecture. And um, it'll be on the history of the Silver Sides. It's going to be a, an interesting topic. If anyone is interested, then you feel free to join us members of the USS Silversides or members of the Michigan Historical Society are free to attend. You can go to the Michigan Historical Society website to sign up. If you are not a member, there's a small fee to attend. If you contact Teresa, she can send you the link where you will register for that. And so we look forward to having a big crowd come out and share the things that we are so happy about, about the Silversides and how she came up from Chicago to Muskegon and to talk about what she did during World War II that made her so incredibly important to the history of our country. Next week is going to be Operation Desert Storm. We're gonna do a one week changeover of our speakers. The speaker will be Ron Janowski. And we'll be talking about how in 1990, the world changed for a lot of people and the world changed for the United States military. Iraq invaded Kuwait. And during that time, the United States together with an entire consortium of the rest of the world banded together to get Kuwait back its own independence. Ron Janowski will be talking about that next week. And tonight's lecture will be on discussion of the changes from the American military from Vietnam, from, from Vietnam to 9-11. It's going to be looking at what is the difference between an all volunteer military and, and a military that was drafted. And what are the changes that occurred in our military during that time frame? Tonight's speaker is the wonderful Fred Johnson, who we are thrilled to constantly to have this semester, this time. And we're excited that he has so much knowledge and so much passion. And every each and every week that we're here, you can see that passion coming through and it's exceptional and wonderful. And I thank you all for coming tonight. And if any of you are interested in hearing the history of the Silver Sides, please send the email to Teresa and she can send you the website that you go to to sign in to get the history of the Silver Sides. And thank you. And I will turn it over to to Fred now.
Thank you, scholars of the Silver Sides. Good to be with you all again to go over this next subject that Peg was so gracious in introducing for us. Let's go ahead and do a screen share and get started. Like Peg pointed out, I, I will be involved in discussion, engaging in a discussion this evening about the transition about what happened as the American military transitioned from that institution where you had a draft army, which was most characteristic of what we understand and recall from the Vietnam era into what became known as the AVF, the All Volunteer Force. But while the American military was going through all those changes, it didn't mean that the world stopped. Foreign crises and foreign policy kept going on. Country stuff, countries kept operating for their own national interests, just as we have and will continue to operate with ours. So let's call this a reclamation of power. America was so shaken after the Vietnam War, so adrift, so it seemed that after the Vietnam War. A superpower that seemed to have lost its way, a small nation like Vietnam that nobody really saw being able to beat the United States. Many people just casually assumed that we we're so big, we were so technologically advanced, we had so many people, we had so much industrial capacity. It should have been not an easy win, but a victory nonetheless. And yet, it was not only not a victory, it was a resounding thunderclap of a defeat. And America, the American people, the American government, the American military went into a period of self-reflection and understanding that things had to change. One of the things that began to happen, we talked about how after Vietnam and into the 1970s, the late 1970s and into the 1980s, we had of course a crisis that occurred with the Iranians taking American hostages at the American embassy in the late 1970s. And then right in the same period, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. I share with you all that even Alexander the Great, you know, had said a prayer about Afghanistan and the Afghan people who, are, who have been known historically for being some of the most hard, thorough, efficient, just never give up kind of fighters. May God keep you away from the venom of the cobra, the teeth of the tiger, and the revenge of the Afghans. Anybody going to fight the Afghans, the Greeks found out, the British found out, the Russians found out, and we have found out in our own way. But from May 15, 1988, through February 15, 1989, the Soviet Union began a pullout, a withdrawal from Afghanistan. It was many people calling it their Vietnam. And the comparisons were all too quick to be made with the Russian bear, the communist bear had gotten itself mired into a seemingly in never ending conflict where more and more material, more and more money, more and more human treasure was being lost. And at some point, nobody could figure out what the end game was, but more than that, they couldn't figure out whether or not there would be an end game because the Afghan people have been invaded by so many different people and by, by so many different times and they have never really been defeated. So the Russians began pulling out. This caused a shift in foreign policy in Central Asia and it caused a shift in foreign policy in the Cold War. And at the same time, while things were happening in Afghanistan, we also have been talking about also that in the place that we call the Middle East, Things were also underway, big changes going there, particularly between the nation of Iraq and Iran. During this period, the leader Saddam Hussein, who was a Ba'athist political leader, the leader of Iraq, a military dictator with all the characteristics of rule that a dictator has, the cruelty, the secret police, the lack of freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, et cetera, and so on. But then you had somebody who came to power in the late 1970s, the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who had been in exile in France for a number of years, when finally a revolution occurred inside of Iran, where the Shah of Iran, Shah Reza Pahlavi, fled the country and did not come back. And the people called for the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini to come back. And he established what, he, what essentially today is still a political theocracy, a, 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 a nation that's run by religious leaders. And it turns out from what we've seen in Iran that the religious leaders can be just as brutal as political leaders. So there you have Saddam Hussein, 
who is the leader of a country where for the religious part, for the faith part of that country, Iraq is dominated primarily by people who are Muslim, but there are Muslims of the Sunni sect predominantly in Iran. The people who are in Iran who are Muslim are primarily Shiite. They are the same faith Muslim, but they are different, very different as far as the way that they approach the faith. And we know that in the 1980s, Iran and Iraq went to war. From 1980 to 1988, historians have said that what had happened in that small yellowish region that you see on the map there, the Iranians and the Iraqis threw themselves at each other in some of the most incredible humanly, human destructive warfare of the late 20th century. Ways of young people, that were sent charging across swamps, marshes, and other kinds of terrain to just fling themselves at the enemy to try to overwhelm back and forth. It reminded people of the surges during World War I where you go back and forth between trench lines. So you're covering the same ground, but no real territory is ever being taken. No real progress is ever being made. And it was destructive. It was fatricidal. And it ground on and on and on and on. Now, the thing to keep in mind is this, warfare is expensive. It always has been. To be, to be able for a nation to wage war, it costs, it costs treasure in both money and human lives. And obviously human lives are more valuable. But a nation's treasury, the national treasury, if you don't have a strong economy, if you don't have a nimble economy, if you don't have a well-diversified economy, a war, especially a long war, can come close to bankrupting a country. And Saddam Hussein, as a leader of a country, as a dictatorial leader of a country, as a leader of a country that was at war with another country for eight years, Saddam Hussein, who did not have a great, a great military strategy and who himself was not a great military leader, despite what he told himself, Saddam Hussein was costing himself a lot of treasure and blood and money. And at some point, he would have to respond to that in order to stay in power. The war with Iran would go on. But just as happens with every human being who ever lived, death came visiting and calling upon Ayatollah Ruhollah Khamenei. Now, the Iranian mullahs are still in charge today, but the Islamic theocracy, the Ayatollah Khamenei put in charge or establishing that country remains to this day. Born September 4th, 1902 and dying on June 3rd, 1989, the footprint, the hand put, the fingerprint that the Ayatollah Khomeini left on the modern nation of Iraq, the theocracy in Iraq remains to this day. In the meantime, in 1988, 1988 was a presidential election. Recall that in 1980, Ronald Reagan had been elected president it took office in January 1981. He ran for election again for a second term in 1984. And in 1988, he was finishing up his term. His vice president, George H.W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, the man who had been a World War II fighter pilot, who had crashed at sea, who was legitimately and understood to be a war hero, who had been the director of the CIA. George H.W. Bush, who was a cold warrior, who had tremendous foreign policy experience, he had tremendous experience in government. George H.W. Bush, who had all of the markings of somebody who was qualified to be president in 1988 as Reagan's vice president, he put his bid in and ran for the presidency. This is Ronald Reagan on May 12, 1988, endorsing his vice president. A changing of the guard was underway. The opponent, the Democratic opponent for Vice President Bush was Michael Dukakis, the Democratic governor of Massachusetts. For a time during the campaign, Dukakis was not doing too badly. In fact, for a good while, and toward the end, he was ahead of the vice president. But then his campaign team decided to do something that would pretty much seal the deal. And just to show you how one event, one event in a campaign can change the fortunes for a candidate there's this one there's this one moment for example when Lloyd Benson went up against Dan Quayle who was the vice presidential nominee and although Bush would win the election 
this just goes to show you how tricky events can be and how things can spin on a dime and change on a dime during a presidential election. Just bear with me. At one point during the vice presidential debates, Lloyd Benson and Dan Quayle are debating each other. And this happens. Far more experience than many others have. Far more experience than many others have sought the office of vice president of this country. I have as much experience in the Congress as Jack Kennedy did when he sought the presidency. I will be prepared to deal with the people in the Bush administration if that unfortunate event would ever occur. Senator Benson. Senator, I serve with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. That was really uncalled for, Senator. Keep in mind, that one event did not make Bush lose the election because history records that George H.W. Worse Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush won the election, but it was a bad moment in the election. Likewise, there came a moment for Michael Dukakis, who late in the campaign was actually leading in the polls, who did something which actually was worse than Dan Quayle's moment. Dan Quayle, or rather Michael Dukakis, was known as being weak on defense. At least that's the way he was painted. So his campaign staff decided that it would be a good idea to strengthen up his image as a good pro-defense candidate to have him ride in a modern tank. And then they had him put this tank helmet on, which made him look ridiculous. In fact, if you look at some of the YouTube news accounts, they'll say that the moment they did it, the moment they saw him, the press corps started laughing. Even the, even the venerable Sam Donaldson, the great news reporter, started snickering and chuckling himself and they knew this was a devastating moment. It may not have been the thing that cost the election, but we know for certain this did not help the election. It just did not look flattering and it was trying too hard. Either way, the result was, oh well, we'll do better next time. And George Herbert Walker Bush was elected on November 1988 and became the 41st president of the United States. So the new president, president-elect, he gets elected. We go into the holiday season of 1988. One month, just over a month later, December 1988. Imagine this. Take yourself back in time. It's Christmas time. And you know how we are in America. Christmas and Thanksgiving are all pretty much the same holiday these days. You sit down to have dinner at one. By the time you get through exercising and sleeping off the first dinner, you're getting prepared for the second dinner. So it's just one big long dinner, one big long holiday at dinners. But just a few days before Christmas, as people are definitely in the Christmas mood, the year is coming to an end, things are looking pretty good. The presidential campaign, thank goodness, is gone. No more commercials. We know who's gonna be the next president. While that's going on, on December 21st, 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 took off from Lockerbie, Scotland, and a crisis, a disaster occurred when the plane blew up. And of course, when a plane like a 747 blows up as high as it was flying, even if it wasn't that high, a plane that's already achieved cruising altitude, when it blows up in midair, very little possibility, in fact, no possibility of survivors.
It would take a long time, quite a long time. Starting today, nobody has to settle for less than the very best because only Verizon. It would take a long time, a very long time for the investigators to look at the forensic analysis, the wreckage from the Pan Am Flight 103 disaster spread out over a large, large, large area. The American Federal Aviation Agency, the FAA, the European agencies got involved, the FBI got involved, and just hundreds, thousands of man hours, man and woman hours involved in looking at the possible causes of the, of the disaster, putting the flight together. They somehow managed to get all, enough pieces together to really reconstruct the aircraft, do some forensic analysis, and they figured out over many months of tedious, efficient, just very meticulous reconstruction and forensic analysis. You can see here this headstone. And remember of all victims of Lockerbie air disaster who died on 21 November, 1988. In the final analysis, after all the investigation, after all the forensics were looked at and the flight path, everything, when it's all put together, the investigators figured out the arrow of responsibility was drawn back to the dictator Muammar al Qaddafi, the strong man, the military dictator of Libya. Now, I recall from an earlier session that President Reagan had ordered an airstrike on this guy in 1986 because of a bomb that went off in a nightclub in West Berlin that killed some American servicemen and some West and some West German civilians. So Qaddafi was clearly being a sponsor of international terrorism. And we discovered that it was two agents, two Libyan agents who had placed a bomb on Pan Am Flight 103 at his order. It would take about another decade or so before Gaddafi would finally meet the fitting end for dictators and something that would be known as the Arab Spring, but that will be for a later session. Either way, after, flat, after Pan Am Flight 103, what would have been a Merry Christmas for many people still was a Merry Christmas, but also a very somber Christmas. It was a season of reflection, a season of what Christmas was all about, but also a season of the kind of trouble and fragility of humanity and the state of humanity that reminds us of what so much of why Christmas is a cherished season. Of course, following 1988 came 1989. By 1989, there were some things happening inside of Europe happening around the world that were gonna definitely spell some changes for not just the United States, but for Europe as well. Leonid Brezhnev, who had, been, who had been the architect of what was known as the Brezhnev Doctrine, the right of Soviet intervention, by 1989, the Brezhnev Doctrine was pretty much done. The Brezhnev Doctrine was something that had been in force. Now recall, that Nikita, Nikita Khrushchev, who came to power after Joseph Stalin died in 1953, after Nikita Khrushchev was forced out in 1964, Leonid Brezhnev became the face of the Soviet Union. 
And the Brezhnev doctrine was one which, which essentially said that when communist states or communist satellites, as happened, let's say, for example, in 1968, when people were trying to overthrow the communist government or look like they might overthrow the communist government in Czechoslovakia, the Russians, Brezhnev, sent in tanks. Absolutely no hesitation about sending in armor and weaponry to put down cause for liberalization. I don't, I'm not talking about liberal, conservative, the way Americans use it today. I'm talking about where dictatorships, where people say we want a liberalization of our political system to open it up so people can have freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of whatever they want, the right to do what they want. That wasn't how the Soviets did things, which of course is why they were called a dictatorship. The Brezhnev Doctrine believed in direct intervention in our country's affairs. That's why they were able to intervene or did intervene in Czechoslovakia in 1968, just as the Russians had intervened in Hungary in 1956, and just as the Russians intervened in Kabul and Afghanistan in the 1980s, when that government, a communist government, was about to fall and fall in somebody else's hands. His, re his replacement, Mikhail Gorbachev, introduced something, a policy called glasnost and perestroika, openness and restructuring. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev, for lack of a better way of saying it, was called a reformer. He saw that things needed to change inside of the Soviet Union because things were changing fast. And if the Soviet Union wanted to keep on being the Soviet Union, there came a time, there comes a moment when people can live under a dictatorship, they can be cowed, they can be frightened, they can be scared. And then when the scaring becomes normalized, when the fear becomes normalized, when they get used to it and finally decide that they're no longer that they're no longer going to be afraid anymore, what do you do with people who are no longer afraid? What do you do when you tell them, when they tell you that if you take my life, it doesn't matter? What do you threaten them with? Life? The Soviet Union had gotten to that point, and Gorbachev knew that something had to change, or the nation that Lenin had brought into being in 1917 was about to be in trouble. Now, Glasnost. Perestroika, openness, meant more democratization, what I call liberal, liberalization of the political system. Stop being so tight when it came to freedom of speech, assembly, freedom of worship, freedom to gather, freedom, you know, uh, the, the legal system, everything. Some of the factors that led to the end of the Brezhnev Doctrine, as you can see from this diagram, the invasion of Afghanistan. Afghanistan, as it turned out, proved to be as unpopular eventually in the Soviet Union as Vietnam had been unpopular in the United States. Also another unpopular aspect of the Brezhnev regime had been the propping, the propping up of unpopular regimes. For example, the regime in Czechoslovakia, the regime in Romania, the regime in Bulgaria, and all of the Russian satellites just about, the people who were in charge and the leaders in charge were not liked by the people, and, but however, Moscow made it possible for unpopular leaders and leadership to stay in place. Gorbachev wanted to ease Cold War tensions. And then you see at the bottom, in that, that bottom tier, Gorbachev and Shevardnadze. There was a Russian dissident named Edward Shevardnadze, or rather a, a, his, foreign, his foreign minister named Edward Shevardnadze. Gorbachev and Shevardnadze worked together on bringing this vision of his into reality. No more Soviet intervention in Eastern Europe. That included Hungary, Poland, East Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia. You're talking about the Warsaw Pact. You're talking about the East Bloc. The Warsaw Pact members, that group of nations that after the United States formed NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1949, the Russians responded in kind in 1955 by establishing the Warsaw Pact. Now, on the one hand, this was a response to NATO being established in 1949, but also it was also a response to a good deal of history. We need to remember that Russia or the Soviet Union, both of course the same nation, in 1812, the Russians had been invaded by Napoleon. In World War I, the Russians had been invaded by the Germans. And toward the end of World War I in 1918, the British and the Americans had sent expeditions 
into Russia to try, among other things, stop the Bolshevik Revolution. And then, of course, on June 22nd, 1941, the Russians were invaded again by the Nazis. And it, at even an earlier period, the Russians had been invaded by the Swedes. So the Russians, whether people agree or not, have reason to believe, have reason to, they have historical precedent that they have suffered invasions and the Warsaw Pact, among other things, it was a response to the, to the NATO, it was a response to NATO, but also a buffer zone. That if in fact somebody decided to invade Russia proper before they got to the Soviet frontier this time, they would have to go through East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary. And because you have Warsaw Pact tanks there, and because these are all allies of the Soviet Union, chances were pretty, chances were pretty good that by the time an invading force got to the Soviet Union proper, they would be severely bloody and very much disillusioned and not motivated to carry on with the attack inside of Russia itself. But take a look at East Germany. We spent all that time on Germany and Berlin because as I mentioned to you all in an earlier session, it was believed doctrinally that if in fact an attack from East to West came, it would go through Germany, the fastest route out or through Norway. So this was a very, very, very tense period we're talking about. And more than that, let's go back and take a look at that map. Look at the nation of Poland. What also had been going on during this period was that in Poland, there was a man named Lech Walesa who had been a worker at the Gdansk shipyards in Poland, a very big shipbuilding area and facility. And Lech Walesa became the leader of something called the Solidarity Movement, Solidarnosc. And these shipyards, these ship workers, they began agitating for better work conditions, better political conditions. They wanted more rights. They wanted more freedoms. And if you look at the map of Poland, if in fact the leaders of Poland, and the leader of Poland at the time was a man named Jaroszelski, he began to give away bit by bit to the demands of Lech Walesa and Solidarność, the Solidarity Movement. And the Solidarity Movement attracted more and more people. This was a major crack in the wall of the Warsaw Pact. Right at the time that Gorbachev is in power. So on the one hand, Gorbachev is calling the shots. He is pretty much taking a new vision for what's gonna happen with the Soviet Union going forward. But on the other hand, the Soviet Union, he's seen the writing on the wall, the Soviet days. If the Soviet Union's days are not numbered, they at least are certain that things are gonna to have to change. So things were underway at a very fast rate. And as things began to gather momentum inside of Poland, one of the major countries of the, of the East Bloc, likewise, they began to gather momentum inside of Germany, particularly where it pertained to the Berlin Wall. That wall that President Kennedy came to, went to, and said, We're all, we are all Berliners. And then a few years later, President Reagan went there and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That wall eventually did come down. Meine Mutter und mein Vater sind da drüben gerade. Ich gehe jetzt rüber, weil ihre meine Eltern besuchen gehen, ja? Ja. Trabi waren viele gekommen, um einmal den Kudam zu sehen. Wir wollten jetzt mal endlich hier ein Bier trinken und dann waren wir wieder zurück. I knew it will happen the next days. We had a lot of discussions of colleagues from the USA, from Great Britain, but I think nobody of us knew that the wall will be open at the same day. Nobody. <laughs> Wie kein anderer hat er das Frankreich nach dem Kriege geprägt, Charles de Gaulle. Heute vor genau 19 Jahren ist er gestorben. Und hier nun noch die Lottozahlen. Bei der Ziehung des deutschen Lottoblocks wurden gestern folgende Gewinnzahlen ermittelt. Ja, Luft. <lacht> Thank <laughs> you.
Die Ausreise von DDR-Bürgern hält unvermindert an. In den letzten 24 Stunden kamen über 11.000 Personen über die Grenze der GSSR nach Bayern. Wohin schlägt das Stimmungsbarometer in der Bevölkerung nach den neuesten Informationen aus dem ZK? Eine Umfrage heute in Ostberlin. berlin Endlich fällt man von einer Ohnmacht in die andere. Ja. Aber so sehr interessiert es nicht mehr, weil wir an dich weg waren. Also... Did you notice in the broadcast, in the in the subtitles, that the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, let me let me let me take a pause for a second. For some reason, during the Cold War, nations that were dictatorial or had dictatorial governments loved to call themselves something something democratic. They always put the word democratic in it, although they were anything but democratic. You'll also you'll very often see, for example, on the African continent, where you had these leaders who have been in power for. 10, 20, 30 years, they're always talking about democracy. Well, of course, it's a smoke screen, but the GDR is called the German Democratic Republic. It was a dictatorship. But you'll note in the subtitles that the German Democratic Republic was having problems. Problems in East Germany was a metaphor for problems in the East Bloc, and also a metaphor for larger problems back in the Soviet Union. And did you also read in the subtitles, the one lady who said, There, we're, there's powerlessness and we want to leave and we just don't care anymore. Again, what do you threaten? People were smart enough to know. They lived in fear and in terror of reprisal for decades, but they got to a point where finally this generation of people understood that the leaders and authority, those in the, the system was losing its power. People were crossing borders, not without punishment, not without reprisal, but they were doing it anyway. And they kept going And the more they did it, the less and less interested the authorities, those who were enforcing the old rules became and enforcing them into the future. Things were going to happen inside of Eastern Europe. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. And of course, it was the beginning of the 1990s. And on January 1st, 1990, Mikhail Gorbachev had his face on the cover of Time Magazine for that year's Man of the Year. Perestroika and Glasnost were things that people were talking about the world over. And they were making changes. But there were also things that were happening in the early 1990s too that were going to bring America's attention, bring American foreign policy leaders, the American military into a new concern, that area called the Middle East. Now, we have said in an earlier session that this is not the first time that Americans have been concerned about the Middle East because we talked, for example, about the blowing up of the US Embassy in Beirut and then the subsequent blowing up of the airport in Beirut in 1983-84. But in, 19, in August 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Now, I'm not going to go deep into this because as Peg pointed out, Ron Janowski is going to give a deep dive, an excellent presentation on this. But just to, just to set, set us up, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, remember I, I told you that during the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq racked up a pretty much a, a skyrocketing bill that it couldn't keep case with the war. The, the, the bankruptcy began to dawn, the, the difficulty of paying for the war, and Saddam invaded Kuwait to try and recoup some of those finances and tried to make some of that economic pressure go away. Well, if you look at a map, just a map of the region, you can see that anything that Saddam Hussein does in the region, if he goes south to Kuwait, if he goes to Kuwait, it's going to be a problem because Kuwait happens to be near a US ally called Saudi Arabia. And keep in mind, this is the early 1990s. Now, since the 1990s, The United States has become pretty much oil independent. We've become an oil exporter because of things like fracking technology and exploration and a whole number of other things. But in 1990, America is still very much an oil dependent nation. And oil has can have an adverse effect upon the economy. Many people can, people can lose their jobs. It can cause inflation. So what happened in or Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, two major oil suppliers producers and suppliers to the United States was very important. And then to the north of Kuwait was Iran. 
which was already sponsoring terrorism in the region. There was no way that American policymakers were going to or could possibly ignore an aggressive action from Iraq against Kuwait that shared a border with Saudi Arabia in 1990, 1991. So Saddam invades in August, 1990. And this is a closer look at that geographic situation. On August 2nd, 1990, America implements Operation Desert Shield. Ron will tell you all about that next week. What eventually happens is America will go to war against Iraq. And this is where we get to the part we have this discussion about the military that America goes to a war with, war with in Iraq is vastly different than the one we have fought with in Vietnam. The draftee army in Vietnam. Not everybody who fought in Vietnam was a draftee, but we had a good number of people who were drafted and went to Vietnam. They did their duty. They did their duty well. The reason why we ought to have so much respect for those Vietnam veterans and for those Korean War veterans. Those Korean War veterans still live with the fact that so many people don't even know about the Korean War or why we fought it. That's why so many historians refer to Korea as the Forgotten War. And the Vietnam veterans, the Vietnam veterans, the 17, 18, 19 year old people at the time they were kids, got drafted, sent to Vietnam, that as time moved on, the country became more and more disenchanted with and then became hostile about. And then for some reason, people turned their hostility not toward the policymakers who are making sending people to the war, but to the soldiers, women, and men who are fighting the war. And when they came home from Vietnam, they were given the most unpleasant, ugly welcome of any generation in, in modern American history. From the time of 1975 to 1990, when Operation Desert Shield is implemented, the American military went through a major interrogation of itself, an investigation of itself, and people began looking at the type of soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guards, coast guards, women and men, and they decided to switch from the draftee army to something called the ADF, the all volunteer force. What we have today right now is a military force that's called the all volunteer force. People join the military today because they want to. They volunteer. Post-Vietnam, when I joined the military, I wasn't drafted. I joined because I wanted to. I grew up in a military family. My grandfather was in World War II. My father and my uncle fought in Vietnam. It was just a thing that you did in my family. You joined the military. So likewise, when it became my, my, my generation's turn, my cousin joined the Air Force. My cousin went to, my, I had an older cousin that went to Vietnam. It was my turn to join up. So I did, part of the all-volunteer force. The all-volunteer force predicated upon what? That generally speaking, and it's just basic human nature on one level, isn't it? That people who do something because they want to do it, as opposed to them being told to do it or being made to do it, if people do something and they want to do it, they're already psychologically and emotionally invested in it. It's their decision. They'll follow through with it. Chances are better that they'll follow through on the commitment. It's easier to motivate them. They'll take it more seriously. They'll be more dedicated to it. And they're more motivated to be excellent at the job that they do. So the American military changed its recruitment strategy and began changed the kind of qualifications that people had to meet minimally to join the military. And what we have today in the United States is one of the most potent military institutions on this planet are all volunteer force. But there's something else to recognize about what happened from 1975 to 1990. Now that we were about to impose or get, get involved or we were launching Desert Shield and what happened after that came Desert Storm. Desert Shield was the buildup because when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, America had a presence in the Middle East but not a large ground presence because of the nature of the geography, 
the history and particularly East-West relations, talking about, I'm not talking about East-West as in Cold War, East Soviet Union and East Bloc and, and Warsaw Pact, but I'm talking about the Middle East, Christian versus Muslim, old historical stuff. That kind of history overlaid the situation. It contextualized the situation. So a lot had to be taken into account. But one of the things that had to be done because there had been no significant Western presence in the Middle East, at least not American, not like that. And because of what happened in Beirut in 1983, great care had to be taken when American troops deployed to the area for theologic reasons, for religious reasons, for political reasons, for historical reasons. The Middle East was and is a very complicated region of the world. So Desert Shield was the buildup, getting men, women, and material to the front line so that if you're gonna go to war, you have people on the front line to move out. Once you get them there, and then it's time to go to war, that was Desert Storm. But one of the things that they, did not, they were not gonna do, the persons, the chief planners, the chief leaders who were involved in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, they remembered Vietnam. And they were absolutely dedicated, committed, determined that there would be no repeats of Vietnam. One of them, General Colin Powell, a major planner who during the Vietnam War had been a company commander. And also the person who became identified as the leader of American forces during, during Gulf I mean, Desert Storm, General Norman Schwarzkopf. During the Vietnam War, both of these guys, you see Colin Powell on the left and Schwarzkopf on the right, both of these guys were Vietnam veterans. They were not going to make the mistakes because it wasn't just a question of politics. These men commanded troops. These were company commanders. These, were, these, these guys had soldiers lives in their hands because if you know anything about the military, your first objective, the first thing you're supposed to do always as an officer is to take care of your troops always. Never ask them to do something you either can't or won't or aren't willing to do yourself. So they had lived through and with a period of leadership that had been imposing its will upon the soldiers on the ground where they were during the war. And this time, when the war started, there would be at least these fundamentals. We're gonna know why we're going in, we're gonna know what the objectives are. We're gonna get, we're gonna throw everything we have at the objective. And then once we accomplish the objective, we're going to get out. There will be an exit strategy. There will be not this endless rolling, moving the goalposts of someday and body counts and all this other kind of stuff. There will be a clear interest point, a strategy, a tactic, and then we will leave. That was the big change of the American military as we go into Desert Shield and Desert Storm. On January 16, January 17, Operation, Operation Desert Storm was launched. And again, Ron Janowski will give you all a wonderful presentation on that next week. It'll be a fantastic American victory. President Bush will go to Iraq and congratulate the American troops. With the, with the victory in Iraq, many people would say that the American military was back, that we have returned from that malaise, that, that second guessing, that head scratching, that, you know, who are we? Can we do anything? Remember Viet, the loss in Vietnam, the Namayaguez being taken over by Cambodian pirates, the failure to get our troops back, the failure to get our people back after the Iranian hostage crisis, the debacle at Desert One in Iran, could not get our hostages back. The entire nation being held hostage by the Iranian militants, or as we call them militants. The, 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 the humiliation internationally over and over and over again. And the world began to wonder, can the United States be relied upon as a military power? Yes, you're a big nation. Yes, you have a lot of people. Yes, you're a wealthy nation. Yes, you have a lot of technology and weaponry, but can you be relied upon to get the job done? What good does any of it do if you have people, wealth, money, equipment, if you can't, in the final analysis, get the job done? Iraq proved that America was back and could get the job, could get, get the job done. If you look at a map of the world in 1980, 
This was so much of the world covered in red. Look at that. All of, the, all of Russia, Eastern Europe, China, Mongolia, of course, in Southeast Asia, you got Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, the Korean Peninsula. Things were changing though, the world was changing. By the 1990s, the Soviet Union had seen its better days. The headline in the New York Times on December 9, 1991 declared, the death of the Soviet Union Russia and two republics form a new commonwealth. History was changing before our eyes. The revolution that had been started some 70 some odd years earlier was coming to a very grinding, crashing end. You see this political cartoon, Gorbachev looking at the breakup of what had been the hammer and the sickle, the symbol of communism globally and for the Soviet Union particularly. And again, this one, on December 26, 17 days later, Gorbachev, last Soviet leader, resigns. US recognizes republic's independence. Nations like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, all now independent nations had all been part of the Soviet Union, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and so many others that have been part of the Soviet Union, suddenly free and independent. So scholars of the silver sides, it was over. The Cold War had come to an end. The gatekeepers who had stood watch at the end of World War II through the Berlin airlift the gatekeepers who had stood watch after the Berlin airlift, but then were called to duty for the crisis in Korea in 1950, and then had to endure through three years of warfare and then come home dissatisfied with a ceasefire. The generation that had to endure the buildup in Vietnam after the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, and the American troop involvement began slowly with advisors and then a full blown a full bone buildup in 1965. Then for the next eight or nine years in Vietnam, trying to figure out where is the end game? What is the objective? Taking land and giving land away, seizing objectives and giving objectives back again. The political chaos at home and the anti-war movement. They had stood, they stood watch on the gate. And then after Vietnam, that generation, those warriors that stood on the gate, those women and men who responded to the Mayaguez incident and the takeover of Cambodia and the killing foes of Cam the killing of two million Cambodians under Pol Pot, another bloodthirsty, di another bloodthirsty dictator at the end of the 20th century. And then another generation that would be sent to Beirut and 234 Marines lost their lives. These people had stood on the walls of the gate defending values, ideals, freedom. I never forget them and I can never stop thinking about them. That period from 1975 to 1990, when I was at the last stages of coming into my adulthood, I tell my students to help college very often. Just a few years, a few years ago, some of them wanted to go down to a place called the School of the Americas, where apparently it's a school where the United States will take military personnel from South American countries and Central American countries and send them through military training. And they wanted to go down there and, and, and protest and say that you know, they were basically training and aiding and abetting people who will be future dictators. And they're part of the crisis, of, part of the cause of the crisis of so much violence in Central America. And they came to me and they said, Professor Johnson, come down here with us because we know that you look at this stuff, you don't like what's going on in foreign policy. I said, yes. There's a lot of foreign policy that I don't that, that I disagree with. And I told them, no, I'm not gonna go with you, but I want you to go. I want you to go, I want you to protest. I want you to, I want you to go down there and take a sign and take your bullhorn or whatever you need and scream to the top of your lungs about whatever you think it is that's upsetting you about American foreign policy. I said, but I ask of you only one thing. While you're down there protesting, 
remember that several thousand miles away, there's some 19 year old woman or man walking a guard post on the 38th parallel separating North and South Korea, then walking that guard post is paying the price which buys you the freedom to make that protest. Because just as it was at the end of the Soviet Union, end of the Cold War, start of the Cold War, freedom is not free. Someone pays the price all the time for us to be free here. So it ended and that generation did it. We had gone through so much. Khrushchev, the October Missile Crisis of 1962, so many standoffs, near misses like the one I told you all about when we were in the Norwegian Sea in that war exercise. The space race had been part of it. Sputnik that caused so much alarm for the United States when we thought that we were so technologically advanced and the Soviet Union so technologically backward and we got our heads handed to us in 1957. The hot wars that had to be fought elsewhere in Vietnam, in the Middle East, in Korea because you could not afford a direct confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. Those generation of gatekeepers had done their job. Every last one of them, not the generation from 75 to 90, not just the Vietnam generation, the generation from 75 to 90 stood on the shoulders of the Vietnam generation, who stood on the shoulders of our Korean War veterans, who stood on the shoulders of the Berlin Airlift generation, who stood on the shoulders of our World War, our World War II veterans. They all did their part in bringing that moment of history to an end. So many people sacrificed and sent to eternity. President Truman put it like this, our debt to, to the heroic men and valiant women in the service of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifices. And Silverside scholars, the mere fact that we're engaging with this subject matter tonight means I know that at least for you all, you all have remembered and you will not forget. I commend you. You'll notice right here, this, this particular plaque or inscription reads Korean War, the Forgotten War, June 25th, 1950 to July 27th, 1953, when the armistice, the ceasefire was agreed upon. The faces from the Korean War, the faces of that conflict speak for themselves. It was a new kind of war a limited war. Their phrase had never been used in American military history. What is a limited war anyway? It's the kind of war that you have to fight in a Cold War. And like all wars, young men fought the war. Young men bore the emotional scars of the war. The young women and men who had to fight that war, some of them were changed forever by it. This is a picture showing a man named Father Emil Capon. Emil Capon is a man on the right. Father Emil Capon was a Catholic priest from, from Kansas in the United States, who in 1950, early in the Korean War, his unit was surrounded. And the company, the, the company officer said, we're going to evacuate. But the Chinese had come, in on, had come in on the side of the North Koreans. And Father Capon decided to stay behind and tend to the wounded, even though he knew he was guaranteed to be captured as a prisoner. Father Capon stayed behind and for the next few weeks while he was naked and freezing in Korea, he gave sacraments, he went out foraging for food even though he knew it, he could be shot for doing so. That kind of sacrifice was a kind of heroism that we simply don't know too much about and we need to dive deeper into as a, as a gesture of gratitude to say thank you to these gatekeepers in Vietnam, and after Korea, then came Vietnam from 1964 to 1975. They called it the helicopter war. Helicopters, things that we have today like medevacs, triage, so many of the, the, the things that we find to be advanced medical technology today and techniques, 
Sadly, they were discovered or developed on the battlefields of war, the Vietnam War. And we learned to use Viet, we learned to use helicopters with great efficiency during the Vietnam War. Vietnam in the 1960s, that decade of the civil rights movement where black people and white people seemed to be at each other's throats in the United States. But on the battlefields of Vietnam, it just didn't matter. All that mattered was taking care of your fellow grunt. And we absolutely do not want to forget the service of women. In United States military history, women have always done their part. This is not some new phenomenon, some new reality. Women have always been involved in warfare. If you think about it, if you go back and look at your history, the United States is one of the few countries on earth that's had a long standing debate about whether or not women could actually be involved in combat. During World War II, women in Russia were on the front lines. They were flying fighter planes. They were snipers. And the Israeli Defense Forces today, because Israel lives in, a, lives in a bad neighborhood or generally a hostile neighborhood, men and women are equally valued in all roles, Cam combat arms, logistics, or whatever is required. But during the Vietnam War, we want to we want to give proper deference and attention to our sisters who took care of so many people during that conflict. And the many, many, many who did their duty, made that sacrifice and came home to an ungrateful nation. And I'm so happy that today we say thank you for your service. So there they were. The job of the military by no stretch of the imagination was over. Because after all, a thing called 9-11 was coming. But for that generation of gatekeepers from 1975, that last gatekeepers generation, they stood, on the, they stood on the shoulders of those who had come before them. And like those before them, they made us proud. And they gave us a legacy that we can be proud of. And they gave us lessons to learn that need to be taught and never forgotten. And with that, I will take your questions. Well, I found that a very interesting presentation. So touching on a couple of things that you brought up when you were talking about that now it's an all volunteer draft or volunteer service, is there ever the chance that we don't have enough to serve? And so then do the people who are the heroes that step up to serve, are they getting asked to do more and more? Or are we just not able to do what we used to do? Or how does how would that work? You know, Teresa, there's something called the reserve system. Okay. You have a lot of people that join the National Guard and a lot of people who will be on active duty and they'll get off active duty, then they'll go into what they call the, the reserve system. Now, what happens depending upon how you enlist and where you enlist and when you or the contract you have when you enlist, some people enlist, they go through basic training and they go immediately to a reserve center. I don't know if you ever heard, have you ever heard of the phrase weekend warrior? Yes. Okay, so these people, once a month, they go to their individual re reserve station and they'll go out for maneuvers or do what they have to do during the weekend. And let's say they may do that for three, four years, three years, four years. That's one type of enlistment. Another type of enlistment, and let me speak, let me speak in terms of Marine Corps officers by myself. I did my tour of duty and got out and then went and served in the reserve unit for like another seven, eight years. Some officers will get out and they'll be required to serve three, four years. Now there's class one, class two, class three. Class one is when you're on active duty. Class two is when you're in that area where the weekend warriors are. So to get to your question, if we're out of enough people who are on active duty every day, these are the people that get up every day and what they do is they go and do military every day. You see in our most recent conflict, specific, specifically since 9-11 and especially since 2003 when we invaded Iraq, what happened was that a number of people have been activated from the reserves. They've been activated from reserve to active duty and then being given a term, you'll be on duty for 12 months, then they have those extensions and so on, 18 months. Some people had three years, some people have requested more time. So the reserves are the first fallback. Now when you get to class three, and I always tell my students, if it, if, if it ever gets to the point where they start calling up class three people, that is me, you know, bad knees, replace hip, that means we're probably losing <laughs> when you get to that level. So 
here's what here's what goes on. You have the people who are on active duty right now, which I think we have somewhere right around a million or a million or so. I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but the last time I did, we had right around a million people or more, just just over that in uniform, which is a pretty good chunk of you know good number of people. But when you consider the number of people we have in uniform compared to the overall population, that's a real smart part of our population that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Then on, behind them, there are the people in the reserves. Now, if in fact we get into a conflict where the attrition begins to be where the reserves begin to buckle, then it may be, because we, we still have people who are registering for the, in selective service, so the draft is out there still as a possibility. But I think that policy, as far as I understand it, as far as I have followed it, policy is trying to keep away from that as much as possible because we've had such tremendous success with our all volunteer force. Other questions? Scholars of the Silver Sides. I mean, with the changing face of warfare today, do you think that the draft will someday become obsolete or will it always be a part of society? Well, well, Amber, tell me what you mean about the changing face of warfare. I'm talking unmanned drone technology, things like that. How war, just the way that it's fought is being changed a little bit compared to, you know, World War II, the Korean War, et cetera. Let me tell you, I know that, I know that technology is having a direct impact on the uh, upon warfare right now as we speak. You mentioned unmanned drones. All right, yes, that's definitely one aspect of it. Let me let me see if I can find something real quick for our for our scholars, because when you speak of the changing the changing elements of warfare, this is something that kind of keeps me up at night. If warfare comes to this. Let me see. Because you're right about one thing, the face of warfare is definitely changing. And we're becoming very, very, very reliant. Some people might say too reliant upon technology. I would think with the introduction of the new Space Force as a branch of the military, I don't think we're envisioning a lot of people going there. So I guess the technology people are going to be more in demand for something like that, I would think. Yeah. Just give me a minute, these infernal ads. Okay, what I'm gonna show you has been something, there's a company called Boston Dynamics. This is what they've been working on. So watch this. Amber, 
when you say the changing face of technology and the changing face of warfare, now, on the one hand, the research I've done on this particular project and things like it, they say, well, we're just developing these kind of robots so that, you know, like, for example, when someone, there's a burning building, we can send a drone in there to get a, burn, you know, a, a, a person who's in the building and rescue them and save the lives of firemen. I'm gonna leave it up to your imagination to figure out how long do you think it's gonna be before something like that is weaponized for warfare? I bet it already has been. Okay, and there's other things called the Big Dog Project. Let me show you that real quick too, if I guess, this, this, is some, this is another thing they've been working on. Amber, I don't think he means your Great Dane puppy. <laughs> oh man, she was in here with me a few minutes ago. It was a whole thing. So she's a, she's a wild one. Well, this will give her some- hey, what you need with Liberty Mutual. I, I just said that. God, I hate these commercials. So this is called the Big Dog Project. Now the drawback with that thing, of course, is that if you use it, you clearly are not trying to gain the element of surprise with all the racket that it's making. But the point is they're testing that kind of equipment and they do have some that are much quieter. The Marine Corps has already been looking at things to be like, you know, I think about uh, a mechanical pack mule so that soldiers and Marines that are ha having to carry heavy packs with their food and their weapons and radios and crypto gear, even though it's become mini miniaturized. So the face of warfare is changing. And your question, Amber, is, so what will that mean for human beings? You know, I've had students do projects on this, and we always have this question. If it gets to be too clean technologically, do you end up like that drone, that drone operator in New Mexico? He can launch a strike from 11,000 miles away, then they go home and eat dinner? What does that do to their perception of warfare, as opposed to the person that's right there on the battlefield and has to live with the horror of it all, but we don't want our people in harm's way? So, America, as historically, as a, as a military historian, I can tell you that America, particularly after World War II, has always tried to find a way to fight war on the cheap. That is, immediately after World War II, we said, well, we have the bomb. We don't have to have a big army and navy. We'll just use the bomb. Well, when the Russians exploded their bomb in 1949, you couldn't say that anymore because they had the bomb too. Now what do you do? But the naval, if, if you're interested in reading about this uh, Silver Side Scholars, I would recommend to you, for example, the Naval Institute Press. The Naval Institute Press, which is the publishing arm of the US Naval Academy, they have articles on this stuff all the time, talking about command, control, the future of warfare, human beings in warfare, the integration of technology with warfare in human beings. Because the question is, if warfare gets to be too easy, does it mean that we do it more often and don't care about it? If it remains ugly, does it mean, and because the, on the one hand, you might say, well, yeah, if it gets to be too easy, Maybe we will. But on the other hand, human history has shown us that human beings for, for generations have known the ugliness and horror and cruelty of warfare, and we still do it. So it's not been enough of, of a deterrent. In fact, we're trying to find more efficient ways of doing it more efficiently with a wider destruction. You know, there's a reason why it's attributed to General Robert E. Lee during the Battle of Fredericksburg in late 1862. You know, he allegedly said something, you know, like this. It is good that war is so terrible or else we should grow to love it. And there's something to be said for that. It's horrible and it is costly and we know that and we know we shouldn't do it. But just like I was talking to a, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's a psychologist, he went, look, you know, it's like some of these habits. You know, people do things every day with, you know, with, with their bodies that they know, they, they know it's bad for them, but they do it anyway. How do you explain that? 
we know warfare is bad, but we can't find a way of stopping it. And national interests and things like that get involved and it becomes a very difficult discussion. Other questions from our scholars or from you two? <laughs> yeah, we don't wanna be the only ones asking questions. Well, I think that I think that the uh, as I as I mentioned during the presentation, the introduction of the all volunteer force. And I, I remember even when I was on active duty, Teresa. You know, I had some some colleagues of mine who were saying, "Well, you know, that Vietnam Army, they 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 did this and they did that." I said, "Wait, wait, stop, stop, hold on a second. The Vietnam Army did what they were told to do, and they did it." Um, we're, we're, we're in a different era, you know, in fact, we're in a different era. We, we, we are getting the benefits of what we have now in our generation because they did what they did, right? If we do the generational handoff the right way, the baton from one generation to the one coming behind them, that baton will be in better shape. And so I always tell my students, I always, always, always tell my students, particularly when I'm teaching military history class, when you go up, if you go up 31, Toward Grand Rapids, and see some guy standing there, you know, with a, with, you know, with a, a cardboard sign saying, you know, un, you know, homeless veteran need help. Before you say, before you cast aspersions at that guy, before you look upon that woman as being somebody, you know, who's got le less than enough energy and motivation to get themselves together, what that is, ask yourself, could you have gone through what they went through, and would you be different? Now, if the answer is yeah, good for you. But the price that's paid for freedom isn't the same price for everybody. And I see a lot of these signs, you know, where you see a veteran that's missing a limb or they have head injuries, psychologists, you know, it's the scars you can't see that are the ones that are the longest lasting. So we owe our veterans such a tremendous debt of gratitude. And I never, I can never get tired of saying, saying thank you. You know, I took students, Teresa, to, Vietnam, a colleague of, I, uh, of mine, Dr. Scott Vanderstoop, we didn't go last year, obviously, because of the COVID virus, but in 2017 and in 2019, we took students to Vietnam. I can't tell you how, the number of American servicemen who fought in Vietnam, who are going back to Vietnam. And these guys, you know, they fought in Vietnam, they came back, some of them are B-52 pilots, some of, them are, some of them were just grunts, but they fought in Vietnam, and what they saw there, what they went there, somehow they, 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 their consciousness merged with that country. They're going back now to try and undo whatever was done by that war to help the Vietnamese people where they can. And some of them just go back because that's where they lost their youth. Mm -hmm. That's when the best of who that 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 when they that when they were at their youngest and strongest and best, they left her right there in that country, and they're going back. I don't know if they're going to find that person, but they go back there because that's where they feel most at home. One of them told me. And he said, he came back to Vietnam, found himself, he says, I'm never going back. So there are lots of stories. They're poignant and we owe a debt. And that's why we at the Silver Sides Museum are proud to be able to try to find those stories and preserve those stories and kind of do our part of the whisper down the line. We weren't there, but maybe we hear it and we can share it with somebody else so that it's not forgotten. So we appreciate that you keep bringing these stories, the history behind the stories to them, because that's what we do. And we feel like it's so important and it just can't be lost. And you know, sharing through these lecture series or just the exhibits that we have, anything like that, that we can do so the people, maybe it's not that they're even forgetting, they never knew and they get to hear these yeah. different things. I mean. For me last year at Lost Boat to be able to share the memories of a gentleman who served nine patrols on the Silver Sides during World War II. He and I yeah. became very good friends and it's like, I'll never know what he went through, but maybe if I tell it to somebody else, they can at least for a second imagine it and right. maybe have some more compassion for the veterans and definitely a little bit more respect. So thank That's you right. for sharing and thank you for your service. You're very welcome. And thank you all for making this event happen. Thanks, Fred. You're welcome. Great stuff. Thank you so much. I guess that takes care of our questions.
Now, one of I these did. times when I have you on here, I know you were a Marine. I know you did Toastmasters, which I attended one class and realized somebody sits out there and counts how many times you say, uh, 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 <laughs> yes. never to go back. But you are, also, you are also an author, aren't you? Yes, I am. You did several books I saw. Was it Bittersweet? and Three novels, Bittersweet, A Man Finds His Way, and Other Men's Wives. And yeah. I also co-authored the book on Tupac Shakur, Life and Times of American Icon. I'm working on uh, Hope College there in the latest Sparrow magazine relative to what we're talking about. I I'm working with a student. We're gathering, we're gathering a lot of information to talk about people who, did, who performed acts of love in a time of war. People like Franz Stigler, who was a German, a German fighter pilot during World War II, who came upon an a wounded, almost practically should have been crashed into the earth, American B-17, that was smoking from two of its engines, trying to make its way back to England. And he was dispatched to shoot this thing down. But when he got up to altitude and saw how beat up this plane was and you know, flew around the plane very slowly and saw that there were dead bodies in there and body parts every place, he simply could not bring himself to do it. And keep in mind, Teresa, a German fighter pilot who failed to do his duty like that and let the enemy get away would have been facing a firing squad because after all, the Nazis were in charge of that government. Mm -hmm. Franz Stigler paid attention to his humanity that day and escorted those guys to the coast of Europe, let them fly across the channel and make it back to England. And the beautiful thing about that story is that Charlie Brown, the pilot of the aircraft, at the end of World War II, he started attending these B-17 reunions. And sometime in the 1980s, someone asked him, you told us a story about this crazy German fighter pilot, whatever happened to him? Well, Franz Stigler ended up behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany. And then he somehow or another uh, fled or managed to get out of East Germany and made his way to Vancouver, became a businessman, did rather well, and retired in Vancouver, Canada. And one day he gets this letter or phone call from Charlie Brown saying, hey, are you the guy that escorted that B-17? He went, yeah, I'm the one. They ended up reconnecting. And for the rest of their lives, they were the closest of friends. Wow. In fact, Franz Stigler started attending the reunions with Charlie Brown and they became these celebrities. And it's just, you know, there are so many stories out there about women and men who paid attention to their humanity and the God who made them, as opposed to the dictatorial government telling them just to kill, kill, kill. It's the same thing that happened with Charlie Brown and, and, uh, and the guy, Karen is a, a white Navy captain, a white Navy fighter pilot who saved this guy's life during the, during the Korean War in, 19, in 1950. You know, in 1950, America's nowhere being near on the cutting edge of racial harmony and reconciliation. But in Korea, this white fighter pilot did a crash landing, voluntarily crash landed his airplane to try and help his wingmen out. That's what we're talking about here. These, kind of, these are the kind of people who do the fighting for us. And that's the kind of history I like. I guess my reputation at the museum is the social historian, the people behind the story. So it sounds like you're right. working on a very interesting book on those two people that found each other after all those years. The white fighter pilot, his name is, I mean, I just remember his name, Thomas Hudner, H-U-D-N-E-R. He died, he retired as a full naval captain. And do you know, let me tell you this real quick because I know we're running out of time. He promised his friend, Jesse Brown, the day that he crashed on his aircraft, he says, I promise I'll come back for you. Now, Jesse Brown knew he was never gonna make it. Tommy Hudner came back to the United States. The Korean War ended. Tommy Hudner went on to work for, you know, he got all that Navy, retired a captain, went to work for the Veterans Administration. But in his 80s, in his 80s, he got, he got permission from the Korean government to go back to North Korea and try one more time to bring the bones of his friend home. He didn't make it but he kept his promise and tried to go back. I mean, you know, what do you do with that? I read that stuff and I'm not prone to crying easy, but I got to tell you, I cried that day. Yeah. That's what we're crying about. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So anyway, fun being with you all. You too. Thank you again for another wonderful lecture. Thank you for everybody to, who joined us and have a good week. And we will all see you next Monday, except not Fred. You get a Monday off and we'll see you in two weeks then. Okay. Look right. forward to being with you. Take care. Bye.